boa tarde a todos. Good afternoon. In this panel before the last in this congress that is a huge success, I would like to congratulate also the IBDT on the person of its chairman, Dr. Ricardo Maris de Oliveira, a dear friend. Congratulate also the organizer, Professor Luiz Eduardo Schoeiro, Flavio Neto, Rodrigo Maito, and saying that difficulties presented by the pandemic showed as the organizer as few, they transferred uh, the presential event to one online without losing anything whatsoever. So congratulations for RBDT and the organizers of this online event. The subject addressed by this panel, transfer, international transparency, general information for tax purposes and taxpayers, right? It's absolutely key. And I would like to do brief comments regarding why this subject is important. It's fundamental for, for three reasons. The first being many times debates regarding international tax law are so complex dealing with technical points and details of international taxation, transactional economic facts, so partnerships and financial partnerships with many players and jurisdictions involving the analysis of multilateral uh, documents written, translated, and commented in several languages. And you might lose sight that behind all this, we have rights many times, fundamental rights of taxpayers, individuals, and corporations. Therefore, the first reason for the importance of this panel. The second reason is that with advancement of technology and the uh, signature and execution of more treat treaties celebrated amongst countries. It, this, for some years, was just a wish, this transparency, and currently is a reality. The opening new fields for questions, legal questions regarding these exchanges, and especially regarding issues involving the pro data protection and tax information of taxpayers on different jurisdictions, especially its enforcement and use in such jurisdictions once the, these informations are exchanged. The third reason now reaching the end, it's the urgent need of a balance amongst requirements for transparency, taxpayers' rights and procedures, both administrative and judiciary and legal and tax and criminal, for supervision and collection of taxes. This balance amongst transparency and supervision and collection will demand a joint performance of many countries that exchange these informations. And the risk here I leave, my first food for thought for the panelists, the risk I see is that perhaps exchanging information might be an element that will push this balance tip the skill in favor only towards procedures of supervision. So to have here is retraction regarding taxpayers' protection in favor of supervision and tax collection. I congratulate again the organizers for the choice of this important subject. And we will count with authorities well known both in Brazil and abroad to address this subject today with us. First, we have Professor, it's not in order, but uh, for better call, the Professor Irma Mosqueira, Professor at Leiden University in the Netherlands and main researcher of European Research Council by Global Tax Body and PhD in Netherlands and Fulbright Scholarship in USA, New York and Florida. Second, Professor Patricia Brown, professor at the University of Miami and professor in residence now at IBFD Netherlands 020. We have also Dr. Raquel Novaes, counselor well known in Brazil and master in right, professor university at Miami and professor in residence at BDF. So, one master at UK slash São Paulo, and then we have a professor of the University of São Paulo, head of the UPS University, 
Rio Grande do Sul, be a doctor by the University of Munich in Germany, and well-known and recognized panelist and counselor regarding tax subjects in Brazil. Marcus Neder, PhD and Master's in Law from the Pontificia Catholic University of Sao Paulo. He's an engineer, economist, and jurist. For sure, he will help with his point of view because he was at the other side of the table as subsecretary of Linda Revenue. Thank you, Marcos. And then our panelist, Roberto Cordonis, associate professor of the Professional Master of International Tax Law and Development of IBDT. And then we have Professor Pedro Adami, President of the Tax Studies Institute. So thank you very much for being with us today. Professor Humberto, you have the floor. I would like before, on behalf of the Dr. Pedro Adami, thank for the invitation that was made also the President of IBDT. Dr. Ricardo Maris de Oliveira, congratulating the organizers and especially Roberto that kindly conducted the works in a very competent fashion. My subject dealing with an aspect which is domestic. I know there are many panelists that are part of this panel, therefore I will focus on the issue regarding confidentiality of data within the Brazilian law. You know data protection on the private sphere, either through a principle, rule, and our constitution chose to do it through the paragraph two of the article that we know and that was subject matter of many judiciary decisions and it's set forth and you cannot violate this confidentiality of communication of data and communication by telephone, except for the last case, which is telephone communication by judicial order under the assumption set forth by the law for the purpose of criminal investigation with within the criminal scope and instruction. If we attend ourselves according to our constitution, whereupon we can like it or not, but it's the preamble that we have in the constitution and investigate it as logic and in this fashion, we reach a conclusion that it is more or less like this. So if A, then D, except X or in good Portuguese, without private information, therefore it's not, you cannot violate, except if it's telegraphic communication by legal order under the legal assumptions and criminal investigation or, or instruction within the criminal sphere. In other words, there was an option by the constitution of setting forth the protection of data. So we can like this option, but it was the option adopted by our constitution. We might like it or not, i.e. this provision sets forth a rule and this rule prohibits that without court or the data of those, whomever it is, taxpayers, can be passed through to different individuals or authorities. Of course, that this uh, norm might be construed, but the interpretation does not seem to be that connects it three assumptions. Either you reach the conclusion that as in order, for the worst scenario, there was the prohibition, and for the less worst, necessarily we must have the conditioning so we have a court order. So to investigate criminal investigation, the constitution sets forth you need a court order with more reason when it's dealt with an issue that does not involve criminal investigation. So here we would use the argument of fortuary. Another hypothesis would be the following. If this constitution allowed only for telephone communication, therefore necessary because it prohibited for other assumptions of cases, let's say like date 
confidentiality, both assumptions and when we interpret, interpret or construe the outcome is necessarily a prohibition. Therefore, my opinion, our constitution is absolutely clear guaranteeing data confidentiality. You cannot violate it. This is by the Constitution. Nevertheless, we know that there are court decisions by the STF rulings about the subject and what do they rule. And then we have the issue regarding how this rule was interpreted by the STF or Supreme Court. At first, in 2008, vote by Ellen Grace minister, it was understood that privacy was not absolute due to public interest could be the breach of data confidentiality. In 011, conversely, the same STF ruled that the condition was a rule by the Constitution and confidentiality of data could only be breached by express authorization by the court. Therefore, this inland revenue could not open the data confidentiality. O15, the same STF ruled that this instruction express a principle and based on the duty of paying taxes and the solidarity principle, it was understood that it was not required court order. And therefore, the Inland Revenue could access bank data without any kind of requirements. In 019, the same Supreme Court STF as a injunction understands that without your or court order, one cannot breach data confidentiality. But this injunction by the same court ended by not being confirmed. And in 019, okay, there was a decision by the plenary by nine by two votes saying that it could be shared without court or the data of taxpayers. So one can see now that what happened here was that it deserves a special attention by us. I will resume briefly what the STF did in 08 regarding the need or allowing or not breach of confidentiality without court order. In 08, it was understood that it could do it because it was a principle. In 011, it said it could not because it was a rule. In 015, it said it could because it was a principle. In 019, it said at first could not because it was a rule. And in 019, by the end of the year, it said it could because it was a principle. So see how fantastic the case law of the STF, Supreme Court. Yes, no, yes, no. So a principle, rule, principle, rule, principle. So with all due respect, it deserves and it does the Supreme Court. Here we have a case law jurisprudence, at least it's a problem and does not favor legal safety and no assumption. So what's behind this case law jurisprudence that it tips from one side to the other by the SGF. What is behind this is the between shocks between private and public interests and the end shock between domestic interests, let's say perhaps international law of international bodies. And it was understood according to my the limit of my knowledge and my knowledge, our constitution should not express a rule that prohibits it would express a principle. And this principle could be subject matter of a balance with other principles within which the principle of criminal investigation, criminal effectiveness and so system and principles like transparency, solidarity, whatever. 
So here we have a first problem and an issue that seems to be that must be answered. This rule, is it the principle? Is it a rule? If it one or the other, the who is reading will interpret according to its will and choice and opts for one or the other, or the this expresses one of them and the interpret should abide by the choice made by the constitution. On the other side, we have the issue regarding to the, the relation between domestic right law and international law. And here we know that we have guidelines of international bodies, especially OECD, in the sense that we must have a flexibilization of data confidentiality in favor of transparency to of publicity for the reaching public purposes. And then we have a question. What is the relation that it's giving between domestic and international law one overlaps the other or not in under which assumptions if it's so, yes and what conditions the international law overlaps the domestic looking the stf case law we reach the conclusion that this what is known on public interest it always it was the reason behind justifying the decisions by the stf it, we waived what it's set forth according to my constitution, that it's very clear in favor of these international guidelines that foresee the flexibilization of data. And following this line, and my time is almost due, and I must do a link with international law, an issue that should be subject matter of answer perhaps in this pen or it deserves reflection on our side it's regarding knowing the following and now we have no sound so i'm sorry i think we have oh there are constitutions completely different from brazil so this provision i read now and and I analyze, we don't find any other similar to the constitution of those countries that members of OECD question. These guidelines of this body with this composition, should they fit as a guidance for Brazil that has a constitution that's different and they have a different rule? or not. So here, food for thought, I, I ask, if the OECD is made up of the executive branch representatives of developed countries, do you think Brazil should follow the guidelines of the fox to know how to take care of your own hands? And disregarding what is set forth by its own constitution, this is a question. And naturally, there's this tie that comes from modern law forward, which is the supremacy of the public interest over the private one. The old question always on the table that helped way to prepare constitutional law and administrative law, but we, the 88 constitution was put under test. But these decisions by the STF of Supreme Court, of course, they are, decisions that can be according to the doctrine that can be criticized and be done here with all due respect it must be met so what we have according to debate regarding the normative the rules if the data confidentiality can be breached without authorization authorization by the courts and the tax authorities can get the information directly over the sectors like the banking sector without authorization and share the information, the public, all the in private information, confidential information. So the question is the due legal process, how it will be shared the information, by whom it will be shared, and with 
what's the purpose behind all, all this sharing the information, especially regarding the rights by those affected in the sense of knowing what's being done with the information, the purpose of the sharing amongst other points. My side, my dear friends, was a brief uh, exam of domestic law, constitutional law, and I passed the floor to to Pedro Adami to follow with the works, and I thank you for the joy of being part of this panel. So thank you, Professor Umberto, and certainly very enriching food for thought, Dr. Roberto, now it's your turn. Thank you very much for your talk. In fact, we see that the President of the Senate 2015, the commitments signed by Brazil at that time, the cause that would push the Supreme Court and it would be permitting the access to information. And uh, what we see, if you consider the situation in Brazil, what we are adopting over the last treaties, Article 26, with the clause that impedes the bank sigil. So Brazil also is part of the multilateral convention uh, as Brazilian commitments, to, not only because of soft law, so in a global way, but also in some cases, permitting this process of exchange of information. Now, I pass the word, the word to Marcus Nader that will expose concrete examples how a taxpayer can be affected and sometimes they don't know the reason why it is happening to him. And in this case, we place also in evidence when we talk, uh, according to what Professor Lombardi has said, the, the, the right to be notified and know the reason why you're being affected. And there is this exchange of information and what's the finality of that for that exchange. And it's very evident. Professor Marcos, for instance, you're taking the floor, Professor Marcos. No sound. Sorry. Thank you, Roberto. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I thank the honored invitation by IBDT. Congratulations to the organizers of this event. It's a success. Professor Luis Frave and Professor Shui. And also, my talk follows the line. The organization was done very well. I'll deal with this theme according to what Mr. Umberto has presented, Professor Umberto. In fact, it is a very quick progress concerning exchange of information. I remember that a certain time ago, I left there because it was very difficult to get information from abroad, given and receiving, you say this, Surveillance, you see, we asked and after the problem was passed, we received the information. But last years, we are integrating that hearing to agreements of exchange of information. And the moment, the present moment, I was seeing the insights of the OECD, and I was surprised to see the classification of Brazil. Generally, Brazil is not very good in this world map, but here, it's said that the exchange of information required and 
answered totally by OECD line, largely complied. So it means that Brazil gives and receives information fully. And following this path, the fiscalization concerning the annual report has published the information, the amount of information exchange. I'm sure, I'm sure that the next lectures will discuss about it. But a situation with the United States, six six thousand four hundred information exchange with CRS, eight hundred sixty thousand information concerning banks and counter by counter report. Thirty four countries exchange information. One of these days, I was uh, uh, just watching an OECD with a federal revenue debate, and they received uh, over hundreds of tax rulings reports. So there was a complete change nowadays. Brazil, if the question is placed, there is an answer. On the other hand, who is supplying the information? Is there any guarantee that the other country is not being aggressive in terms of the tax base? Because it varies this exchange of information. You have to protect your tax base. The attacks of the competition, they say the tax competition is always repeated. And uh, there is a concrete example, I will not involve the names, but it's a via crucis of this process. A taxpayer living in country A has the right to be explored. And this right is sold to a Brazilian company that will use this right here and abroad, in Brazil and abroad. Uh, so it's fiscalized, country A fiscalizes the taxpayer. And the rules are covered, but they are intrigued because there was a transaction concerning the sales of this right years before, and the amount paid was verified, everything was okay, but they required information from the part of the Brazilian company, uh, the taxpayer, and the Brazilian company denied, saying that it's a state of confidentiality, and so concerning that there was no participation in the company. But the country A asks to all the clients, almost a hundred of clients, to supply the agreements, the contracts, 90% of them denied to, due to the confidentiality in the contract. Some of them went to court not to supply the information. A client in Switzerland went to courts and got the right not to supply the information. And so in fiscalization, country A decided to ask the Brazilian countries uh, excise to supply what they needed and to avoid double taxation. And so the interesting part started here. The excise went to the Brazilian company, but did not see that they were there to get information to fulfill. They opened an MPF, and now it's EPDF. That is a diligence, and they required the seizure of any document. And uh, there, the contracts as well. The taxpayer was intrigued because uh, they did, had already done what was necessary. They accessed the information, asked what's the reason of that? Because if it's exchange of information, he did not understand that he had to supply it because he does not have a relation. Country A wanted to ap uh, apply a different rule saying that it was there was a link. Uh, so excise, Brazilian excise said, I'm not supposed to inform. The taxpayer went to court and said, please qualify what's the reason of this request? Because if it's exchange of information, I understand that uh, this is a mere investigation, a preliminary one from another country. There's no fundament to request that. The judge 
uh, in this case says in the injunction, no, there is no element here. It's just a case concerning the taxpayer. So in the process of investigation in the country A, the request of this country to Brazil based on Article 26 of the treaty, exchange of information, it's to avoid double taxation. And lately, it was seen the answer from Brazil, not the information, the answer. They will get the information, that's the answer. So I got intrigued because who answered that was a coordinator of tax affairs in the hierarchy of excise. It would be third or fourth rate. So we are exchanging between two jurisdictions. If you compare to the ministry, it would be sevens or eights rate. So in a singular way, the authority was giving this type of information without any contradiction. And the taxpayer was asking that. So what happened in the award with more information, the judge said that, yes, information can be exchanged if there is treaty, there is an investigation process in another country, and it's affirmed that the other countries has to maintain the confidentiality. So using the experience of Brazilian experience concerning information in terms of public services, information is finally informed all the contacts with differences in terms of trade, where the different prices, uh, structures in terms of trade that were different. With the result of all that, the country says that uh, the, the retaining the right, in this case, the Brazilian company was of the regime of uh, taxation of 34 of Article 4, the presentation also with teams, so it was okay. May I carry on? Okay, practically all the revenue was transformed into tax because it was double taxation. Curiously, he said, okay, it's not up to me to do this compensation of taxation. If Brazil decides so, we follow the group agreement procedure. It means two countries in agreement. But if you observe the domestic rule, if anything that you start in terms of administrative defense, judicially speaking, according to the experience I learned, in this situation, this map takes two or three years or more. And curiously, it's, they don't have to give a result. If the country understands that the tax has to be paid, it's maintained. The position is maintained. And Brazil, without no examination, preliminary examination, Brazil had positions in the past that were favorable. So Brazil, even revising the position, the other country will not understand. You say, but the transfer price in terms of taxation, uh, so part of the revenue was there and transformed into taxation. And so the taxpayer had to pay in advance because of the, that's the system there. And so end of the story. The operation was considered double taxation. So the taxpayer was not defended properly. And the, the hypothesis of the exception in Article 6 was not considered. So what the taxpayer saw that what he was left in hand with what? We do not have tradition in this case. Nowadays, over the last years, with all the scandals that we had in the country, when anybody says supplying information, it's supplied immediately. Uh, so where is the right of the taxpayers? All the countries have to protect that, the, the taxpayer base, the tax base. Uh, so it was a taxpayer that paid and collect correctly. So 
what had in the end is just change doors here and move to another country. That's the system, that's uncertainty we should have in terms of bank confidentiality, we should start an other mechanisms. You have to have motivation to do that in this area of exchange of information. It would be necessary, Brazil, to reconsider the procedures, uh, giving chance, analyzing the situation concrete, not simply supply just to be good in the picture with this ECD, OECD, because it's harming Brazilian economy well, and taxation here in Brazil. These are my main comments, just giving some concrete information for this discussion, because normally it's so theoretically discussed, the reality that is imposed cannot the excise have the permission to go to got any information to, sorry, to obtain any information at the company saying, oh, it's a seizure, it's a diligence that we are getting based on a treaty of exchange of information. There's no, no transparency on the other hand, it's, it's the harm, the transparency prospect. So it is exactly part of the comments I want to do to enrich the debate of this table. And I pass the floor back to Professor Pedro. Thank you, Professor Marcos. Certainly, we have a lot to consider knowing what happens con concretely with this exchange. I was puzzled the number of exchanges. I did not imagine that it was so much. It's very interesting, this aspect. Transparency, or not from the part of the taxpayer, it's the administration. So we have to be very attentive to that. We have to have access to uh, to the company's information, but from the point of view of the administration, it's not always that the uh, performance is accordingly equivalent. This is a very interesting case. And now I pass the floor to Professor Raquel Novais, which will discuss the modalities of exchange of information. Uh, so it's a national movement that Brazil is part of it. Exchange of information of the different modalities. And uh, Professor Raquel is taking the floor. Thank you, Professor Roberto. I would like to start greeting the organization of this event and IBDT for the organization of this event that is beyond any adversity that is this moment that we're crossing, you see, offering us a forum of high quality. I would like to thank the invitation. I'm honored to share this panel with professors that are experts and I admire. The theme transparency is very useful to I would like to touch it and regain some concepts based on cooperation, international cooperation, and by its turn, uses the exchange of information as a main instrument for this cooperation. The exchange of information channels established among the states agreed terms in treaties via which the com competent authorities of one state have authorization via these channels as established to transfer information, exchange information. There are five ways of doing this exchange of information in the convention. Uh, administrative mutual assistance, assistance in tax matters, didactically it uh, defines the 
exchange of information mechanisms. The first one, the most common one, it is under request. The authorities, the competent authorities, a country requests information to other country about a certain subject specifically. And it's also named EOI standard. The second one is automatic exchange of information. Puts aside the request and it's done periodically about a certain data previously agreed among countries. A spontaneous exchange of information when a country detains an information that is of high importance to the other, assumed so, delivers this information to the other spontaneously. Of course, there are requirements regulated in situations, specific situations. Then we have uh, simultaneous fiscalization, two authorities doing investigation simultaneously, so simultaneous tax examinations and exchanging the results. It's normally in Europe. And tax examinations abroad or the countries where a country requires that the other one follows the results and the other country follows and obtains the information resulted from this fiscalization. The exchange, the international cooperation has a background over a century. One of the benefits of the forums of IBDT, I consider one among many, is being an important instrument of updating about academia and uh, scientific production. And I pinpoint the uh, work that was presented to this year that I visit, that is Roberto Cordonis is the author and we are, is our moderator. And uh, the name is International Cooperation, Fiscal Cooperation, based on the research that is excellent about the theme. And Professor inserts co international cooperation in three stages. The first one is started on the 19th century, after that, 20th century, until the end of it. And the stages there, the main objective was seeing their company flourishing and developing. And therefore, the objective of the countries with the international cooperation was avoiding double taxation. It would be the biggest focus and also elision, tax elision. Uh, a subsidiary objective, expressions that are important in this period. We have uh, OECD Convention Model in 63 in Article uh, 26, describes the regulation of the information required, is being developed and expanded concerning its scope, and we also have in 88 the, the setup of uh, the first uh, version of the convention that was set forth and uh, executed on that date. Therefore, with this period, we conclude with this result, many exchange of information required in bilateral environments. And in 98, we have the second stage of international cooperation, uh, and it starts with the OECD harm to tax competition report. Uh, so harmful competition. So it pinpoints the harms caused by the 
fiscal competition among states, having as instru instruments the uh, benefic instruments, we call it fiscal war here, or tax war, and the harms of this trend globally speaking. So this stage starts with a new focus for countries that are in uh, international cooperation, just uh, uh, combat to competition in terms of tax. Uh, so important things happen during this stage. Uh, OCD relaunched at that time the Convention for Bilateral Exchange of Information uh, outside the scope of uh, double taxation. In 2009, restructuring of the Global Forum on Tax Transparency, having new signatories, no, no members of OECD, having another dimension to the transparency aspect. In 2010, we have FATCA in the United States and uh, the amendment protocol, the convention that was uh, amended on to admit the non-members of ECDE, that's the main uh, instrument of exchange of information. Recently, the number of signatories that I checked, we have 137 signatories of this convention. And okay, in 2011, European Union directives were launching that, that time, launched at that time. Third stage, ah, okay, before that, uh, concepts of tax haven, uh, the tax uh, regime that were privileged, that were integrated through domestic law. And the third stage starts with BEPS. BEPS. The objective there was the prevention of tax illusion and evasion. One of the pillars of that project is transparency and coherence and substance, the other two. In, in this third period, a second period until the second stage, the exchange required EO standard was the standard for exchange of information. From now onwards, the exchange IEO was the standard required for the exchange of information from that point onwards. And so automated exchange is then done with reports, country by country reports, etc. So this is a picture that I present just for having the list of the main instruments in the history of cooperation and the mechanism of exchange of information, the base of them. How is the position of Brazil here in this cooperation, international cooperation? In the beginning, very feeble, as Professor Nether has pointed out. Let us say double taxation till today, we signed only 34 considering that for its dimension is very feeble. If you consider BRICS, the main have three times that. Mexico, our neighbor, has almost a double of that. So in this matter, Brazil was very feeble. But in 2001, it launched its forum and law 104 was enacted. And it permits, let us say, dropping the CGO, the bank CGO. And this is an important landmark in internal legislation. Of course, it's been accepted by the Supreme Court that understood that was constitutional, correct, as long as there is an ethical process involved. Therefore, it needs a previous judicial order. So Brazil established several uh, treaties concerning exchange of information from 2007 onwards, member of the forum, Global Forum of Transparency, and uh, signatory concerning mutual uh, administrative uh, assistance, and after that, uh, facts and all the mechanisms to put into practice the autom automatic 
exchange of information. So there is the base uh, in the financial aspect. There is the model of OECD. Uh, the, the companies have to give this information with CBC. And since 2018, they are receiving and exchanging the volumes of the other countries. And what we, we've seen in this, they've received the rulings and the countries reach nowadays a stage that is very advanced, a big advance in terms of transparency over the last years. Uh, we have the space with control and visibility of almost the life of the taxpayer, because in this mechanism, it's not so efficient when it refers to examination of what's outside the financial market, let us say, other activities. But it's another story. The states, yes, are in a level of apparatus that nothing escapes or very little escapes concerning the taxpayers' uh, attitudes. If in the past uh, it was not, the data was not broken, was not violated, there was secrecy, there was privacy concerning data, they were protected, only exceptionally seen. Nowadays, it's exposure, the rule, with one single exception, that is what the treaties consider an impediment to justify the transfer of information, protection of commercial data and industry. Okay. So commercial secrecy, the word nowadays, in fact, there is no protection concerning bank secrecy, uh, so there's no justification nowadays. They cannot refuse when it refers to bank secrecy. So that's what's left. What I would place here, food for thought following the other speakers, Every movement, as any pendular movement, the extremes are not the required or wanted ones. We pass to one, from one state to the other, and the taxpayer does not have how to prove its rights. And the criticism I do, which I understand, it's based our, on our system. The balance of this pendulum would be a safeguard concerning procedures. The taxpayer state has access to having the information and uh, to the taxpayer should the same right of procedure, knowing when the taxpayer is having its information passed on in order the taxpayers, according to our rights, our law, it's a right of defense that's fundamental, constitutional, therefore, using and having the power to use the rights. So the pendulum has to be centralized and the safeguard concerning procedures for the exercise of the rights of the taxpayer. With that, I end my talk. Raquel, muito obrigado pela, pela Raquel thank you very much for your presentation. And thank you very much for mentioning my book. It was a gift from you. Thank you very much that you were going to address my book at this time. I'm very honored for you mentioning my book, as I said. Now I would like to 
pass the floor to Professor Patricia Brown, who will talk a bit about the context of other issues that are important regarding the protection of data, confidentiality of data supplied by taxpayers, and she will bring concerns that are in our radar, but certainly they deserve reflection on our side. So I invite Professor Patricia Brown, and I thank you, Ron Tenzin, and the attendants of the panelists here today that dedicated your time to be here with us in this panel. So Patricia Brown, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. And, Muito and thank you for the invitation uh, to speak at this conference. Uh, hopefully someday we'll all see each other in person. Um, you know, when I get invitations, sometimes they're about things that, uh, you know, I can, I can speak about many things, but I was very excited when I got this invitation because there were a number of things that had been bothering me uh, and this conference required me to really focus on them and think about them in a more rigorous way. Uh, and so um, we've heard, R Roberto, can you go to the next slide? Um, we've heard from all three of our prior speakers about the need to balance the public interest and the individual interest. Uh, I've collected here some of the different ways that uh, foundational documents refer to this. Uh, and I'll actually uh, give a little advertisement for uh, Philip Baker, who has written a series of articles in um, for the IBFD publications on uh, tax cases involving human rights in uh, the European Court of Human Rights or the European Court generally. Uh, and they're very interesting and they show this balancing uh, in a more general way. Uh, and I think that uh, Professor Raquel's reference to the pendulum is very relevant here because I think obviously we're swinging in very much in favor of the governments right now. And it's really up to practitioners and academics to force the pendulum back uh, towards individual rights. And so this panel is, uh, is an excellent reminder uh, that we need to do that. Uh, so to get into the core of those things that are bothering me, if we can go to the next slide. If you look at the past on information exchange, uh, we've had this maybe relevant or foreseeably relevant standard, and that's really a balancing test. And it says that you can invade someone's privacy only if uh, there is a connection to a tax case. And the intention is to guard against phishing expeditions. And so, I think we would all say that we have a pretty good handle on how uh, information on request should be handled, but, but there are differences in countries' approach to the use of the information that can still create problems even under the old standard. And so, uh, for example, in the United States, there's a case called aloe vera where a taxpayer sued the US competent authority uh, because information had been provided to the Japanese government under the tax treaty. And the taxpayer's argument was, everybody knows that information that is provided to the Japanese tax authority will appear in the Japanese press. And therefore, by providing the information, um, the taxpayer's rights were violated. That case went on at least a decade, and I think it was close to 20 years. And at the end of it, um, the court agreed that in fact, the IRS had provided information 
to the Japanese tax authorities in a way that was inconsistent with the treaty and therefore the taxpayer won. But the damages in that case were limited to $1,000 per taxpayer. So after about 20 years, the taxpayers walked away with $4,000 from the IRS. Uh, so even if the taxpayer has some rights, there's a question which we'll come back to at the end about what is the recourse in these cases. But the aloe vera case at least suggested to the US competent authority that they have to be very careful about what the recipient country is going to do with taxpayer information. Now that aloe vera is gone, there is a, a new case that is just starting uh, called PURI, P-U-R-I. And I think it's going to be the next very interesting case in the United States on information exchange. Um, the IRS uh, is trying to execute an information request uh, made by the Indian government. Uh, this case has presents a number of issues. There's an argument about difference in use. Uh, information that the, the Indian government uses information in a way that's different from the IRS, from what the, what the IRS is allowed to do, uh, and that is a defense that has been made in this case. Uh, there's also a question about the scope of the request. Uh, it asks for 16 years of bank information, uh, which, and during part of those years, at least eight of those years, uh, the taxpayer was actually living in the United States and claims to not even be a resident of India. And finally, uh, the argument is that the request is being made for political reasons uh, in India. Uh, the taxpayer comes from a prominent political family uh, in India. And so the IRS, uh, the, the taxpayer, the bank, the IRS, uh, and the tax court will all be dealing with all of these accusations to decide whether information can be provided. So even under our existing regimes, I think there are questions that still need to be sorted out. Uh, but I think as we move to automatic exchange, the information, the questions become even more difficult and we need to examine our practices to make sure we're still balancing them correctly. I want to say that I am very supportive of automatic exchange of information. Uh, I worked on the secretariat at the OECD when um, in the trace group where a lot of the technical work on automatic exchange took place, uh, which allowed the CRS to happen so quickly after uh, FATCA was adopted. But it's important to keep in mind that when we were doing that in the TRACE project, the assumption was that there would be a pilot group, the work, the automatic exchange would be done voluntarily uh, and incrementally. And so we knew that there were issues that would pop up that would have to be dealt with, um, but we thought we had time to do that. When FATCA and then CRS happened, uh, what was supposed to be a voluntary incremental process became universal and mandatory. Uh, and so now we are having inf automatic exchange of information with many, many countries. Um, and so these issues are bound to crop up. Uh, and so if we can go to the next slide, if you look at, there was an OECD population uh, publication called Keeping It Safe, uh, which is fine as far as it goes. But if you read that now, it's very clear that the focus was on information that was received, that was exchanged on request. Uh, they talked about making, you know, how to make sure that the information was only available to a very few people, um, that it was locked up, 
at the end of the night that, you know, most of the document was about, you know, doing background checks on employees. So the concern was that there would be a leak by an individual employee not protecting the information or having access to the information. Um, now, some of the, some of the uh, OECD's work since then has focused a little bit more on cybersecurity. And my understanding is they do send cybersecurity experts, but still the guidance I think has not caught up to the real threats. Um, and that is CRS was designed to have a very seamless process of collecting, transmitting, uh, and incorporating information into the recipient country's matching system. Um, but once it's in the, and, and that's what you need to do, right? To make it really effective, uh, it shouldn't matter whether information is, you know, the IRS or the Brazilian tax authorities are getting information from a local financial institution or a foreign financial institution. Uh, it should go into the system automatically so that it can be most useful to the tax authorities. But if you do that, you have to think about the security and the protection of that information in a different way. Right? It's not enough to make sure your employees are not corrupt or, or just curious in some cases. The IRS has a problem with browsing, uh, employees looking at famous people's tax returns. That happens every once in a while. Um, you have to, the real concern is that you have massive databases that can be hacked from the outside, that are not enough attention is being paid to cybersecurity. And in fact, so uh, last year, Bulgaria's entire tax database was hacked. Uh, millions of people's data was made available to who, whoever hacked it. And you have to question now when you put together the aloe vera case that says that the US tax authorities have to worry about what's going to happen to the information that they give to other countries, what does the IRS have to do before it can start exchanging information with Bulgaria again? Um, you know, the OECD uh, has its processes through the global forum, um, but I guess the question is whether any tax authorities that are providing information can rely on that process. Uh, and so, you know, there is a tendency, I think, for all of us to say, well, hacks are, are a fact of life, but these sorts, you know, the information that is going into um, these databases is very sensitive information uh, and it's hard to recover it once it's disappeared into the dark web. Um, can we go on to the next slide? I think the other point, and th there's another group of questions that I've been thinking about recently. Uh, and, and I will say this came up uh, while I was in Amsterdam at the IBFD uh, and a young uh, lawyer from Kazakhstan. Uh, brought to me the attention, the online cash registers. And I started to think about the information that should be exchanged automatically because we, if you're looking at the maybe relevant or foreseeably relevant standard, we can assume that all information about income is going to satisfy that standard. We may also decide that information about bank accounts may be relevant. But I think things get trickier when we're talking about expenditures. Uh, and so if you think about big ticket items, boats, planes, real property, um, that's information that other countries are, would like to be able to get uh, the US to provide to them in some cases. 
Uh, it's always frustrating to those countries to discover that that information resides at the state level and sometimes even at the local level. Uh, so it's not readily available to the IRS. Um, but the IRS can get that information obviously from the states. Um, there are a series of cases involving what the US calls a John Doe summons. Uh, in a John Doe summons, the IRS does not have to have the name of the particular person, uh, but it can identify a class of individuals. And so going back to the early Professor 2000s. Patrick, please, yeah. I would like to ask you to, uh, to, to conclude your reason, please. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I meant to, I meant to put on a, on a timer and I forgot to do it. Um, no, try to finish that in one minute, if possible. Okay. Uh, and so the, the, the IRS has been collecting information um, for itself from foreign, from about U.S. customers of foreign banks uh, who have put money in those banks and then gotten gift cards or credit cards that they've used for small purchases. But that work has been sort of extended um, with the use of online cash registers. And in the, online, the purpose of an online cash register is for the tax authorities to be able to collect information about the retailer who would otherwise potentially be uh, hiding the income that it's receiving. Uh, but at least in some countries, those online cash registers also record customer data. Uh, and it's unclear, while I'm happy to have Amazon know what I'm buying and reading, uh, I'm less happy about the potential for the government to know what I'm buying and reading and where I'm eating. Uh, and so I think that this is an area, the, the Forum on Tax Administration has put out a publication that really doesn't talk about taxpayer rights at all with respect to online cash registers. Uh, and I think it's something that people should be focusing on. And so um, the conclusion I would make is that we need to ensure, governments will always try to amass information uh, and once they have it, they will want to exchange it with other countries. Uh, and I think we need to be very uh, diligent about ensuring that um, that we maintain the balance that is in the agreements that, that allow for this exchange of information. Uh, so these are some of the, the points that I think are going to be hot button issues in the next few years. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Patricia. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you for your, uh, mm. your, your presentation. Uh, I, would like to, I would like to invite uh, Professor Ilma and uh, now to give her insights, uh, posso falar em português, desculpa. <laughs> Eu gostaria de chamar a professora Irma para agora. Invite trazer. Professor Irma now to bring her, bring us, give us her outlook regarding this point and what we can see according to the study. The more we go to ex automatic exchange of information, more and more we tip in difficulties regarding taxpayers' rights guarantee. I think that's the point that Professor Patricia well said. It's easier to reach the right balance of taxpayers' rights when it's done, when you, it's upon request, when it's automatic, then we have issues regarding confidentiality and so forth and the participation of the taxpayers. Before Professor Ima start, I would like just to present our quiz. So please could the three team show the quiz regarding this issue. What are the rights of taxpayers in the automatic exchange of information if they would have any rights? according to the constitution and if there's a possibility let's say wishful to have the exchange of information regarding their expenses so this is the quiz 
so attendees can vote without affecting the time for the presentation by Professor Irma. Please, the floor is yours, Professor Irma. Yes, okay. Uh, Roberto, how much time I have? Twelve minutes. Twelve okay, minutes. Perfect. If you let me know minutes. two minutes before the twelve minutes, great. And if you will help me with the slides, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation, and I apologize. With the laptop, with the tablet, and with the telephone, and it was still difficult to try to get connected with the camera. So I apologize for that, and also to Professor Nether because there was some sound when I was and was me trying to solve my this problem. So if I would try to have in these 12 minutes, and if Roberto could just go to the next slide, to have to identify, I think that the problems have been identified, but we need to find the solutions. And one of the things that, of course, the OECD is, be, is aware of is that now that we have this system for a change of information, automatic, uh, on request, spontaneous, or at domestic level, but also at the international level, not only with tax authorities, but also with other authorities, such as, for instance, money laundering, oversight authorities, and so forth. The question is now how we can develop a framework that it protects the confidentiality, the privacy, and the data protection. And as all the panelists have already mentioned, we are not talking only about we, there is, of course, a lot of problems, a lot of instruments, but unfortunately, there is no specific instrument to protect this confidentiality data protection of a, in, at least an international instrument, because you look at the multilateral administrative convention on mutual assistance matters, and it will not give you the possibility to discuss, to have rules of confidentiality of data protection. So what happens then is if uh, normally regarding data protection, for instance, the next slide, Roberto, what happens is that a lot of countries, and we did a survey of a comparative study in the past with the Brazil, Colombia, Uruguay, and South Africa, where we identify that most of the countries were following the 1995 Data Protection Directive. But this Data Protection Directive was out of date because, of course, it needed to update it for the AU Directive and, and Regulation, so the new AU Regulation. What happens at that time in Brazil, when we were looking at that, and this was the comparative study like almost four or five years ago, the data protection law was still being discussed. However, now with the new data protection law, it includes also in the same way as the regulation includes the protection of data. But one of the things that happens is that compared to the 1995 directive, when only talks about personal data, the data regulation, the new regulation from the European Union talks about sensitive and biometric data. And sensitive and biometric data, it's a, a, by, sorry, genetic and biometric data are sensitive data and therefore it should be protected. The problem is, as, um, as Patricia, Professor Brown already mentioned, what happens with profiling? If I use the data and I know which political party I am, what are my hobbies, where I, what do I buy? I mean, you may have no problem, but of course we know that all the information is available now for sale. So one of the questions is what happens when this is being used for data profiling? So if they know that you like to travel and you travel so many times to the Cayman Islands, for instance, or whatever, they may say, well, it happens that you are perhaps going to that Cayman Islands and it's not gonna be for because of the nice weather. It happens, for instance, now in the Netherlands, that if you have a double nationality, like in my case, I'm Colombian, I'm Dutch, they will also look at, oh, you are Colombian. Actually, double nationalities will be checked more. So this kind of data profiling, which should not be allowed, it is still not protected in the data uh, protection. And of course, since this data protection only refers to certain part as taxpayer information, then you have problems. Some problems that you can, can have are, for instance, if we are talking about data protection, who is the controller, the data controller, which requirements the data controller we have, which rules of confidentiality, how to storage the information, who has access to this information, what happens if the tax administration gives the, the information to a third party by mistake, 
is that person also bound by confidentiality? In South Africa, it does. In other countries, it does not. So it is important also the training of the tax administration, but of course, this is a, a domestic level. So all these rules, which rules how to storage the information, who has access to information, training tax administration, should be done in each country. So I will move a little more towards the privacy and the data protection. And if I can go to the next slide, please. Yes. So what happens is that we are discussing now both of a change of information. So automatic change of information means that uh, your information is not only what the other country requests. For instance, in, in the Netherlands, it used to be that we have this notification to the taxpayer. So if the tax administration of Norway was going to, not, to ask information from the tax administration in the Netherlands, the Netherlands Dutch tax administration will notify the taxpayer. And the taxpayer will say, actually, you shouldn't give all this information. The reason why the Netherlands took away this notification right is because all the other countries they don't have it. And it seems that it was not a problem. So in a letter of the state, by the State Secretary of Finance in the Netherlands, they say, well, if the other countries don't, we don't, then we don't have a problem. And of course, you have also the requirement of the peer review that it refers to the 90 days for the exchange of information. So it should be timely in a timely matter. So when we look at this, and we look at how now, how difficult it is now, to also use this information because in this case, the information and how to protect the confidentiality, but also which type of safeguards we can see and we need to guarantee the confidentiality and to prevent situations where the leak of information may result in risky situations. Every time when I bring this case and I say, this could be situations where it's information being given, but it, it, it can also cause problems for the family. And of course, they say, yeah, you are from Colombia, so it may be that your past says something about it. And I say, no, it happens also here in Europe. It happens in Eastern Europe. It happens in Russia. Were you able to share all the information with Russia? I don't know. So when we look at that, if you could just please go to the second slide. Here I give you some kind of elements that you have for the confidentiality, like I mentioned to you, the analyze information, access to information, and so forth. Let's go to the safeguards, please, Roberto, the next slide. So when we have the safeguards, then I thought, well, if we are discussing this change of information and we have this automatic change of information, which type of instruments we have? And what is interesting is that these instruments are non-binding instruments. So you have an OECD manual on information exchange, for instance, this is now being used by Brazil where it has all the general and legal aspect of a change of information, including confidentiality and tax secrecy. And then you have, for instance, the confidentiality, the 2013 OECD guide on the protection of confidentiality. But these are best practices and recommendations. And you have the OECD guidelines on the protection of privacy and transborder flows of personal data. Again, guidelines. Please, the next slide, Roberto. And then you have the United Nations 99 guidelines on privacy and data protection. The question is, if we look at this instrument, instrument and we look at how they are guidelines, they are recommendations, but we do not have one specific instrument and we do not have in the mutual administrative convention on assistance in tax matters, but we only have a, a little, this says the confidentiality, whatever that means, and that's it, then, we need to find out and we need to look for some solutions. And then I found in the next slide, please, uh, Roberto, in the 1981 Council of Europe Convention for the Protection of Individuals with regard to automatic processing of personal data. This is only for personal data. So it's not about business data. We were having a conference, a great conference yesterday and today, and Professor Ana Paula Dorado was mentioning about the importance of having your data and the value of your data. And there, what you can see is that if we are talking only about personal data, we are also talking about business data because it's trade secrets, is your list of clients, whatever, whatever you have. And one of the shortcomings of this convention is that it's only for personal data. What happens is that this was a convention by the Council of Europe. So in 2001, there was a protocol that makes possible that this 
third countries outside the Council of Europe will be able to access uh, to sign this convention. And we have, of course, some few members and including Uruguay in this list from Latin America. But then we have the next one, and this is what I think is interesting, because there is a 2018 protocol update. Please, the next one, Roberto. And in this one, it's about the big data. So we not only have a convention for the automatic processing of personal data that is available for countries outside the Council of Europe, could be any, any country around the world, but we also have now a protocol that it says we are going to deal with the big data. So automatic processing of personal data, and in this case, big data. Because what you know, of course, is, as I mentioned before, the data controller, the big data, data mining, the algorithm. If you have, there is an algorithm. And for instance, in this case, there is uh, the algorithm. So then you say, well, the algorithm told me that you need to pay this amount of taxes. Can it still the taxpayer appeal of object that algorithm? If you say, well, no, you may say, yeah, but wh why I'm going to be as a taxpayer, you have to pay so much only for an algorithm because of an algorithm. It could be wrong. So in this case, it gives possibilities. And as you see, there is an obligation to declare data breaches. And there is a new right for the persons in algorithm decision making. And this is important because like you see, for instance, what happens now, tax administrations, and especially in Europe, they gather together and they do kind of data analytics. And they get, see all the computers and they gather together all the information that they have. But it is the amount of information is so much that, to be honest, it's not like you are really looking at the folder and looking every time, oh, I have this taxpayer, I have this taxpayer. They just go with all the analytics and the systems and the software that they have. And then the question is, of course, to start the investigations, but what about the information that is being provided? What is also interesting is the privacy by design. And the privacy by design principle means that uh, you will take into account first uh, is it the design of the data processing is done in such a way that it prevents or minimizes the risk of interference with the data subjects' right and fundamental freedoms. So what does it mean this? That it is not like I will only have a, the processing of data because I want to have it, but I need to develop in such a way that the freedoms and the fundamental rights, whatever that is, but of course we have, for instance, in, in Europe, we have the European Convention of Human Rights, and we also have some cases that I didn't mention here, but we have some of us in our in our blog, in GlovTax.gov, and our project, we have some of those presentations there where we have discussed it also, and in the reading, you have some of those cases, those, what they call the, 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 the fundamental rights. Okay, so to just to conclude, Please, the next slide. What is the way forward? In my view, and Philip Baker always used to say, is not if it happens that there is a data breach, but when it happens. And the Bulgarian case, as mentioned by Professor Brown, gives the good example that actually, yes, it happened. So what we should do about it? In this case, for instance, the Bulgarian case for this millions, because it's really millions, like uh, Professor Brown mentioned, it's four million Bulgarian and foreign taxpayers, in such a way that Switzerland, but also the members of the Global Transparency Forum, decided to stop the change of information with Bulgaria until there was not a, 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 a safeguard for the data processing. In this case was that they hack of they have a, a the tax system, the, 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 the digital systems of the of the tax, the tax agency security systems. So then, of course, this is important. So it's no, if it happens, when it happens, it happened, what should we do now? So then the way forward, in my view, is that we need more taxpayers' rights, more safeguards, more no, now more than ever. And it is the responsibility of the tax administrations to ensure that there are sufficient rules for confidentiality, that there are also safeguards. And look at this Council of Europe convention with also the big data to ensure the privacy, the confidentiality, and also the, the informa in the information exchange. It is also oh, important 
to develop partner projects. Two minutes. No, I, we need to. We we need to finish. <laughs> we need. Okay, we, okay. we are in no so, time. Thirty seconds, please. <laughs> My final thing is, I would suggest to Brazil and I would suggest to all countries to sign and ratify this Council of Europe Convention. And I hope that I have convinced you and there you have also some reading in case and please feel free to contact me. Thank you so much. For, thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Professor Irma. It was a very exciting presentation. We sure have a lot to think about. Uh, Eu gostaria de agradecer a todos os nossos painelistas que nos apresentaram, fazer um breve yeah. fechamento. Uh, infelizmente, nós não Presented teremos... Here. We do not have time for Q&A because uh, the tax six, what are the effects and obligations imposed to the intermediates, lawyers, accountants, and other authorities about planning and reorganization. Certainly, it's a theme that will be part of the next event as a suggestion by the to the organizers. And certainly, we have doubts about the content and the reach of the excise confidentiality, what will be shared and how this fiscal information will be shared with and to whom and what finality and purpose, the obligation of those that receive the information. So following this line, what I learned with my master, Professor Humberto, we always have to place this question in order we answer them as well as possible. And we learned a lot this afternoon. I thank you all. Congratulations to IBT for this excellent event. And till next time, thank you very much. <laughs>